Calvin and Hobbes from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. HTTP colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. Calvin and Hobbes is a comic strip written and illustrated by Bill Watterson. Following the humorous antics of Calvin, an imaginative six-year-old boy, and Hobbes, his energetic and sardonic, albeit stuffed, tiger. Syndicated from November 18, 1985, until December 31, 1995, at its height, Calvin and Hobbes was carried by over 2,400 newspapers worldwide. To date, more than 30 million copies of 18 Calvin and Hobbes books have been printed. The strip is vaguely set in the contemporary Midwestern United States, in the outskirts of suburbia, West 1989. Calvin and Hobbes themselves appear in most of the strips, though several have focused instead upon Calvin's family. The broad themes of the strip deal with Calvin's flights of fantasy, his friendship with Hobbes, his misadventures, his views on a diverse range of political and cultural issues, and his relationships and interactions with his parents, classmates, educators, and other members of society. The dual nature of Hobbes is also a recurring motif. Calvin sees Hobbes as alive, while other characters see him as a stuffed animal, a point discussed more fully below. Unlike political strips, such as Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury, the series doesn't mention specific political figures, but it does examine broad issues like environmentalism and the flaws of opinion polls. Aster, 1989. Because of Watterson's strong anti-merchandising sentiments, Dean, 1987, and his reluctance to return to the spotlight, almost no legitimate Calvin and Hobbes licensed material exists outside of the book collections. But collectors do collect items that were officially approved for marketing purposes. Two notable exceptions to the licensing embargo were the publication of two 16-month wall calendars and the textbook Teaching with Calvin and Hobbes. However, the strip's immense popularity has led to the appearance of various bootleg items, including t-shirts, keychains, bumper stickers, and window decals, often including obscene language or references wholly uncharacteristic of the whimsical spirit of Watterson's work. History Calvin and Hobbes was first conceived when Watterson, having worked in an advertising job he detested, began devoting his spare time to cartooning, his true love. He explored various strip ideas, but all were rejected by the syndicates to which he sent them. However, he did receive a positive response on one strip, which featured a side character, the main character's little brother, who had a stuffed tiger. Told that these characters were the strongest, Watterson began a new strip centered around them. The syndicate, United Features Syndicate, which gave him this advice, actually rejected the new strip, and Watterson endured a few more rejections before Universal Press Syndicate decided to take it. Christie, 1987, Dean, 1987. The first strip was published on November 18, 1985, and the series quickly became a hit. Within a year of syndication, the strip was published in roughly 250 newspapers. By April 1st, 1987, only 16 months after the strip began, Watterson and his work were featured in an article by the Los Angeles Times, one of the nation's major newspapers, Dean, 1987. Calvin and Hobbes twice earned Watterson the Rubin Award from the National Cartoonist Society in the Outstanding Cartoonist of the Year category, first in 1986, and again in 1988. He was nominated again in 1992. Also, the Society awarded him the Humor Comic Strip Award for 1988. Before long, the strip was in wide circulation outside the United States. For more information on publication in various countries and languages, see Calvin and Hobbes in Translation. Watterson took two extended breaks from writing new strips from May 1991 to February 1992, and from April through December of 1994. 
In 1995, Watterson sent a letter via his syndicate to all editors whose newspapers carried his strip. It contained the following. I will be stopping Calvin and Hobbes at the end of the year. This was not a recent nor an easy decision, and I leave with some sadness. My interests have shifted, however, and I believe I've done what I can do within the constraints of daily deadlines and small panels. I am eager to work at a more thoughtful pace, with fewer artistic compromises. I have not yet decided on future projects, but my relationship with Universal Press Syndicate will continue. That so many newspapers would carry Calvin and Hobbes is an honor I'll long be proud of, and I've greatly appreciated your support and indulgence over the last decade. Drawing this comic strip has been a privilege and a pleasure, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity. The 3,150th and final strip ran on Sunday, December 31st, 1995. It depicted Calvin and Hobbes outside in freshly fallen snow, reveling in the wonder and excitement of the winter scene. It's a magical world, Hobbes, old buddy, Calvin exclaims in the last panel. Let's go exploring. Syndication and Watterson's Artistic Standards from the outset, Watterson found himself at odds with the syndicate, which urged him to begin merchandising the characters and touring the country to promote the first collections of comic strips. Watterson refused. To him, the integrity of the strip and its artist would be undermined by commercialization, which he saw as a major negative influence on the world of cartoon art. West, 1989. Watterson also grew increasingly frustrated by the gradual shrinking of available space for comics in the newspapers. He lamented that without space for anything more than simple dialogue or spare artwork, comics as an art form were becoming dilute, bland, and unoriginal. Astor, 1988, West, 1989. Watterson strove for a full-page version of his strip, as opposed to the few cells allocated for most strips. He longed for the artistic freedom allotted classic strips, such as Little Nemo and Crazy Cat, and he gave a sample of what could be accomplished with such liberty in the opening pages of the Sunday strip compilation, The Calvin and Hobbes Lazy Sunday Book. During Watterson's first sabbatical from the strip, Universal Press Syndicate continued to charge newspapers full price to rerun old Calvin and Hobbes strips. Few editors approved of the move, but the strip was so popular that they had little choice but to continue to run it for fear that competing newspapers might pick it up and draw its fans away. Then, upon Watterson's return, Universal Press announced that Watterson had demanded that his Sunday strip be guaranteed half of a newspaper or tabloid page for its space allotment. Many editors, and even a few cartoonists, such as Bill Keane, the family circus, criticized him for what they perceived as arrogance and an unwillingness to abide by the normal practices of the cartoon business, a charge that Watterson ignored. Watterson had negotiated the deal to allow himself more creative freedom in the Sunday comics. Prior to the switch, he had to have a certain number of panels with little freedom as to layout, due to the fact that in different newspapers the strip would appear at a different width. Afterwards, he was free to go with whatever graphic layout he wanted, however unorthodox. His frustration with the standard space division requirements is evident in strips before the change. For example, a 1988 Sunday strip published before the deal is one large panel, but with all the action and dialogue in the bottom part of the panel so editors could crop the top part if they wanted to fit the strip into a smaller space. Watterson's explanation for the switch. I took a sabbatical after resolving a long and emotionally draining fight to prevent Calvin and Hobbes from being merchandised. Looking for a way to rekindle my enthusiasm for the duration of a new contract term, I proposed a redesigned Sunday format that would permit more panel flexibility. To my surprise and delight, Universal responded with an offer to market the strip as an unbreakable half-page, more space than I dared to ask for, despite the expected resistance of editors. To this day, my syndicate assures me that some editors liked the new format, appreciated the difference, and were happy to run the larger strip. 
but I think it's fair to say that this was not the most common reaction. The syndicate had warned me to prepare for numerous cancellations of the Sunday feature, but after a few weeks of dealing with howling purple-faced editors, the syndicate suggested that papers could reduce the strip to the size tabloid newspapers used for their smaller sheets of paper. I focused on the bright side. I had complete freedom of design, and there were virtually no cancellations. For all the yelling and screaming by outraged editors, I remain convinced that the larger Sunday strip gave newspapers a better product and made the comics section more fun for readers. Comics are a visual medium. A strip with a lot of drawing can be exciting and add some variety. Proud as I am that I was able to draw a larger strip, I don't expect to see it happen again anytime soon. In the newspaper business, space is money, and I suspect most editors would still say that the difference is not worth the cost. Sadly, the situation is a vicious circle. Because there's no room for better artwork, the comics are simply drawn. Because they're simply drawn, why should they have more room? From Calvin and Hobbes, Sunday Pages, 1985 to 1995, 2001, Bill Watterson, page 15. Despite the change, Calvin and Hobbes remained extremely popular, and thus Watterson was able to expand his style and technique for the more spacious Sunday strips without losing carriers. Since ending the strip, Watterson has kept aloof from the public eye and has given no indication of resuming the strip or creating new works based on the characters. He refuses to sign autographs or license his characters, staying true to his stated principles. In previous years, he was known to sneak autographed copies of his books onto the shelves of a family-owned bookstore near his home in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. However, after dis discovering that some people were selling the autographed books on eBay for high prices, he ended this practice as well. Merchandising. Bill Watterson is notable for his insistence that cartoon strips should stand on their own as an art form, and he has resisted the use of Calvin and Hobbes in merchandising of any sort. Christie, 1987. This insistence stuck despite what was probably a cost of millions of dollars per year in additional personal income. This also explains why the strip has never been made into an animated series. Except for the books, two 16-month calendars, 1988 to 1989, and 1989 to 1990, and a children's textbook, virtually all Calvin and Hobbes merchandise, including t-shirts, as well as the ubiquitous stickers for automobile rear windows, which depict Calvin urinating on a company's or sports team's name or logo, are unauthorized. After threat of a lawsuit alleging infringement of copyright and trademark, some of the sticker makers replaced Calvin with a different boy while other makers ignored the issue. Watterson wryly commented, I clearly miscalculated how popular it would be to show Calvin urinating on a Ford logo. Some legitimate special items were produced, such as promotional packages to sell the strip to newspapers, but these were never sold outright. Style and Influences Calvin and Hobbes strips are characterized by sparse but careful draftsmanship, intelligent humor, poignant observations, witty social and political commentary, and well-developed characters that are full of personality. Precedents to Calvin's fantasy world can be found in Charles M. Schultz's Peanuts, Percy Crosby's Skippy, Berkeley Breathed's Bloom County, and George Harriman's Crazy Cat, while Watterson's use of comics as socio-political commentary reaches back to Walt Kelly's Pogo. Schultz and Kelly in particular influenced Watterson's outlook on comics during his formative years. Christie, 1987. Notable elements of Watterson's artistic style are his character's diverse and often exaggerated expressions, particularly those of Calvin, elaborate and bizarre backgrounds for Calvin's flights of imagination, well-captured kinetics, and frequent visual jokes and metaphors. In the later years of the strip, with more space available for his use, Watterson experimented more freely with different panel layouts, stories without dialogue, and greater use of white space. Watterson's technique started with minimal pencil sketches, though the larger Sunday strips often required more elaborate work. He then would use a small sable brush and India ink 
to complete most of the remaining drawing. He was careful in his use of color, often spending a great deal of time in choosing the right colors to employ for the weekly Sunday strip. Art and Academia Watterson has used the strip to criticize the artistic world, principally through Calvin's unconventional creations of snowmen. When Miss Wormwood complains that he is wasting class time drawing incomprehensible things, a stegosaurus and a rocket ship, in fact, Calvin proclaims himself on the cutting edge of the avant-garde. He begins exploring the medium of snow when a warm day melts his snowman. His next sculpture speaks to the horror of our own mortality, inviting the viewer to contemplate the fleeting nature of life, much in the vein of Ecclesiastes. Over the years, Calvin's creative instincts diversify into sidewalk drawings, suburban postmodernism. Watterson also directed criticism toward the academic world. Calvin writes a revisionist autobiography, giving himself a flamethrower. He carefully crafts an artist's statement, knowing that such essays convey more messages than artworks themselves ever do. You misspelled Weltanschung, Hobbes notes. He indulges in what Watterson calls pop psychobabble to justify his destructive rampages and shift blame to his parents, citing toxic codependency. Once, he pens a book report entitled The Dynamics of Interbeing and Monological Imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study in psychic transrelational gender modes. Displaying his creation to Hobbes, he remarks, Academia, here I come. Watterson explains that he adapted this jargon and similar examples from several other strips from an actual book of art criticism, 10th Anniversary Book, page 184. Overall, Watterson's satirical essays serve to attack both sides, criticizing both the commercial mainstream and the artists who are supposed to be outside it. Walking contemplatively through the woods, not long after he began drawing his Dinosaurs in Rocket Ships series, Calvin tells Hobbes, the hard part for us avant-garde post-modern artists is deciding whether or not to embrace commercialism. Do we allow our work to be hyped and exploited by a market that's simply hungry for the next new thing? Do we participate in a system that turns high art into low art so it's better suited for mass consumption? Of course, when an artist goes commercial, he makes a mockery of his status as an outsider and free thinker. He buys into the crass and shallow values art should transcend. He trades the integrity of his art for riches and fame. Ah, what the heck. I'll do it. Such sentiments echo Watterson's own struggles with his syndicate over merchandising issues. Distorted Reality Upon several occasions, Watterson begins a strip with a distorted view of reality. Inverted colors, all objects turning neo-cubist, or the world turning to black and white, for example. Only Calvin is able to perceive these changes, which the reader can interpret as Calvin's way of seeing certain situations, issues, and subjects which he has difficulty understanding or accepting. In the 10th anniversary book, Watterson indicates that some of these strips were metaphors for his own conflicts, typically against his syndicate's desire to produce Calvin and Hobbes merchandise. Accused of only seeing issues in black and white, example, crass commercialism versus artistic integrity with nothing in between, Watterson chose to illustrate the situation literally, dropping Calvin into a world where everything had lost shades of gray. Conversely, the neo-cubist strip emerged from the way Watterson found himself paralyzed by being able to see all sides of an issue. Passage of Time when the strips were originally published, Calvin's settings were seasonally appropriate. Calvin would be seen building snowmen or sledding during the wintertime, and outside activities such as water balloon fights would replace school during the summer. Christmas and Halloween strips were run during those approximate times of year. Although Watterson depicts several years worth of holidays, school years, summer vacations, and camping trips, Calvin is never shown to age, nor have any birthday celebrations. The only shown birthday was that of Susie Durkins. This is fairly common among comic strips. 
considered the children in Charles Schultz's peanuts, most of whom existed without aging for decades. Likewise, the characters in George Harriman's Crazy Cat celebrate the new year, but never grow old, and young characters like Ignatz Mouse's offspring never seem to grow up. Since this is such a common phenomenon, readers are likely to suspend disbelief, as most of them do about Calvin's precocious vocabulary, accepting that he was never a literal six-year-old. Tenth Anniversary Book. Social Criticisms. Watterson also often uses the strip as a vehicle for critique and discussion of the many aspects of American culture and society. In most cases, he adopts a sort of resigned indignity at how decadent the American way of life has become, portraying, for instance, Calvin wasting away his Saturdays in front of the television. In one instance, Calvin tells Hobbes that he read a story about how, in the future, machines will enslave and control humanity, and immediately after that, in the next panel, he exclaims that, It's three o'clock! My favorite TV show is on! then promptly dashes off to sit in front of the television, leaving Hobbes to contemplate the irony of the situation. On more than a few occasions, Watterson had made silent criticisms of pop culture's influence on film and art. All of the films that Calvin mentions revolve around the two central themes of sex and violence. Watterson also speaks on the subject of the commercialization of all aspects of life. In several comics, he shares his opinion that the best things in the world often cannot be given commercial value. On two distinct occasions, Hobbes does not get a gift for Christmas. In one, Calvin forgets to buy Hobbes a present, and genuinely feels sorry. In one, Calvin screams that Santa forgot to leave Hobbes anything, and once again, Calvin gives Hobbes a hug to make up for it. In the last panel, Hobbes comments that Calvin's gesture is something he'll remember forever. Both strips are very emotionally charged, and Watterson shows the power of a tiny gesture of friendship.